Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to my Matrix's webinar, Don't Let Non-Healing Fractures Take Control of a Claim. Today's session will be an hour in length. It will be recorded and available on our website, mymatrix.com, in the near future. We are offering continuing education credit for today's live broadcast. Please hold your questions till the end of the session. You can submit your questions in the Q&A box on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our presenters today so we can get started. We have Chuck Sweat, Vice President of Ancillary Development with My Matrix, and Linda White, the Director of Employer Accounts and Workers' Compensation with DJ O Global. I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Chuck, and he's going to get started. Well, thank you, Lori. Good, mo good morning. Uh, today we're going to give an overview of fractures, talk about uh, what are non-healing fractures, some of the risk factors, when to consider surgery, uh, treatment options for non-healing fractures, look at the history of bone growth stimulation and the impact it's had in the workers' compensation market, comparison of different models and makes of bone stimulators, the benefits, and the healing time um, of those different type of units. So just a quick overview of fractures. Currently, we see about 6 million fractures occur annually. And out of those 6 million, about 3 to 5% are non-healing fractures, where you have a break in a bone and the body does not perform its natural healing process. Uh, so that's about 3 to 5%, and that will be the main focus that we'll look at today. Uh, at some point, about 50% of us will face some type of fracture before the age of 65. Um, most fractures, once again, do heal, heal naturally, uh, do not require any additional stimulation. But the majority of fractures, uh, once again, are healed naturally through immobilization, through casting, internal and external fixation, uh, joining that bone and allowing the natural healing process to occur. In the U.S., we spend about $10 billion a year in hospital care um, for fractures. About a billion dollars of that is associated with a physician and office visits per year. Uh, Days missed from work, which is always important to us in the workers' compensation market, and lost wages will re, um, while recovering from fractures are estimated to exceed almost $3 billion per year. So it's a significant dollars of spend when a patient has a non-healing fracture. Uh, Fracture-related direct medical cost in the first year after a fracture, so this is after the fracture has occurred, uh, it varies by body part, but the greatest expense typically occurs through the hip. Uh, the femur, the tibia, and the pelvis um, also have a uh, high, high amount of additional spend, but the hip is the most expensive. So um, when you take a look at fractures in the workplace, workers who suffer from fracture average about 30 days or more to recuperate after returning to, before returning to work. Uh, the median days away from work for a fracture are 30 days. The highest recurrent of fractures are within the local government. The highest number of median days away from work focuses really on the state, uh, the state government, averaging about 33 days away from work. So as we can see, there's a great amount of time away from work. Your return to work period becomes longer, um, the healing time, and when there's additional time when that bone does not naturally heal, uh, through the natural healing process, it can be extended greatly. <clears throat> uh, fractures in the workplace typically occur through falls, uh, being struck by an object or a piece of equipment, the uh, higher rates among men, the average worker uh, is 45 years or older. So at this point, what I'd like to do is go ahead and turn it over to Linda White, and she will walk you through our presentation today. Thank you for your time, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. So some of the risk factors for non-healing fractures is um, to the extent of the bone and the soft tissue damage, the adequacy of the blood supply to the fracture site. And what is important is, you know, diabetics, if you don't get good perfusion or blood to a particular area, you have you can have a, a, a problem with healing of that heat of that site. There's also gaps that may occur if there's a gap between the bone ends 
that may be a risk factor. Um, certainly the presence of infection or some of the external factors are heavy smoking, and we all know that smoking causes hypoxia of the tissue. People who are overweight affects healing. Malnutrition, certainly we're not getting the right nutrients to the, to the bony areas to heal. Um, alcoholism, um, diabetes, we all know that um, diabetes has a major effect on wound healing, and wound healing can be internal from a bone perspective um, as well peripheral vascular disease, and certain medications or steroids. Now, I want to bring up a couple things about medications that you may not be aware of. We talk about medications as steroids, but there are a lot of patients out there have what we call GERD or gastric reflux, and the most commonly ordered medication for that is um, Perazole or Prilosec or the, the proton pump inhibitors. Well, the problem is that they interfere with calcium absorption. So if you have a patient who is also comes in, breaks their bone on a worker's pump injury, they also have GERD, just be aware that they may have a propensity for non-healing of their fracture. Um, another issue that with this is the site of the bone that I want to stress. The two of the bones that are most difficult to heal are the calcaneus, which is your heel bone, and your scapoid. And the scapoid bone is like a peanut-shaped type bone that is in your, in your wrist right below the thumb. Both of these are bones that don't have as good a perfusion as other, um, as other bones have in our body. And so sometimes those, while they may seem small, those might be a high risk factor is just the location of that. Now, when to consider surgery? Some of the factors affecting a surgeon's decision to intervene in a non union fracture would be the site of the fracture, the duration of the problem, if they have an infection or not, some of the status of the soft tissue and the nerve damage that has occurred as a result of the fracture, some of the viability of the bone ends that they're trying to repair, um, vascularity, which we've already talked about, or perfusion at the non-union sites, number of attempts at reconstruction, and you'll see some slides further on where the more you do reconstruction, the lower your opportunity for the bone to heal is. The patient demographics, certainly females and osteoporosis fractures are a big issue to consider there. Now, next slide, we're going to talk about samples or the um, operative orthopedics. This is really the gold standard that's used by a lot of orthopedic um, teaching programs. Um, conservative treatment may be continued for 4 to 12 weeks. Then if the fracture is still unhealed, a decision really needs to be made. Should conservative treatment be continued or should fracture be treated for as for a non-union? And most people go, uh, you know, the 12-week mark you hear or 90-day mark, sometimes you will see is really is just an objective sign because 90%, 95% of the patients attain a human at that site. That's where they come up with this. And I, and I think I want to add something to this is that if you have a patient and they have multiple risk factors in that particular area, um, and it's day 80 of their treatment, but the ODG guideline or the guideline that you're going by says 90 days, you still don't have healing, there's nothing to prevent you from putting that patient on a bone growth because 10 more days, they, if they have all the risk factors, they may not do that healing in that time frame. So just as a word to the wise when you're, you're looking at these patients clinically. Other treatment options for non-union then become Surgical intervention, which would be operative internal fixation where you use plates, screws, and rods with or without bone grafting. And then, of course, there's non-surgical intervention, which is where you would decide to use the bone growth stimulator. Now, on this slide, this is typical non-union where uh, effectiveness of bone graft surgery decreases significantly with each surgery for an individual patient. So you will see that every time you do the surgery, starting with the 85, 70, 33 percent, you will see your chances of healing diminish dramatically. 
And maybe there is a, a, a choice at which you would want to intervene in a conservative manner, maybe after the second surgery that's unsuccessful with bone growth. Now, what is bone growth stimulation? Really, it's, it's an advanced technology, and there's several different types. There's capacitive coupling, ultrasound, PEMP, and, and CMF, or combined magnetic fields. And I'm going to talk about all, all four of those today. These are designed to promote the healing of a bone fracture that has failed to heal in a normal period of time. And I have to say right here that all bone growth stimulation work. All of them work across the board. They may work in a different fashion or may have different uh, features and benefits that may, may work better for workers' comp, but all of them work to promote healing. And you will see, as I talk about the different studies, to make everybody on the same level playing field, I've chosen the FDA studies or the studies they submitted to the FDA, which have to be fair and accurate um, to do some comparative um, analysis when I talk about each one of the different companies. Now, I'm going to briefly go over this. The history of bone stem has been around, oh, since the 1950s. But if you look on the next slide, you will see that really it didn't go come into vogue until about the 1990s and the year 2000s. Um, they, they were, you know, they, they kind of played with different type of things, and I don't want to bore you with the long history, but it, it, it's been around for a long period of time. One of the things that people ask, well, why don't I just, how about, is there any comparative data where you looked at bone growth compared to surgery out there. And one of the things, they did a review of 44 published articles and that they focused on bone growth and um, surgery. And this was on the tibial non-unions. So on all non-unions reported, you can see that bone growth and surgery really had about an even match as whether the people had good positive outcomes, about 81 to 82%. However, when you look at it and break it down by different diagnosis, the open fractures did better with um, surgery. The closed fractures did better with the bone growth. Um, infected nonunions certainly did better with bone growth as opposed to surgery, significantly different. And multiple field surgeries, certainly bone growth had uh, a better outcome with that. Now, when can a bone growth be prescribed for a non-union fracture? Anytime an, an, an intervention is required to stimulate healing. Now, some exclusions, certainly you wouldn't use a bone growth on an unstable fracture. Any male union or ankle deformity. Anytime you have skeletal immaturity, like in a child. A fracture gap greater than one centimeter a little bit less than a half an inch is the separation of the bone. Synovial pseudoarthrosis, um, when a patient refuses to comply, um, any demand type of peacemaker, or if the person is pregnant. And more or less on the pregnancy is because no one has ever studied pregnant women with bone growth, so you can't make that particular type of claim. Some of the economic reasons that you would have for bone growth is you want to provide, you know, quality care. Especially you want to get these people back to work. You want to get them healed in a cost-effective manner. Um, medical is any time you have a person who, where there's a high chance of complications from the surgery. And lastly, um, patient satisfaction. There's a lot of patients out there who don't want surgery. They really want a non-invasive uh, alternative to bone graft surgery, especially if they've already had it a second time. They're much more resistant to going back, you know, as to, in their language, under the knife again and have surgery again. Now, I'm going to go on to the different types of uh, bone growth that are out there. Um, the first one is uh, Bioelectron. It's made by EP ABI. And it's a capacitive coupling type of device, and it is totally external. And it requires two electrodes, requires direct skin contact, and a very, very precise pain 
placement of it. It does require daily battery changes and weekly electrode changes. Um, the downside is the patient has to wear it 24 hours a day, every day. Um, it's not a cell-specific type of thing. You look at on the slide, you'll see frequency operates at 60,000 hertz. That's 60,000 pulses per second. So it's really, um, it, it does um, the dose response, meaning your certain dose that you do, but it only works when the device is worn. Now, when you look at the clinical studies on there that they submitted to the FDA, they found that 72.5% of the patients reported they feel. 69, and when you look at studies, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but when you look at evidence-based studies, you want to see how many people started the study and how many completed it. In this particular situation, 69 patients completed the study out of 126 enrolled. And the, also what the FDA does is do long-term follow-up and they look at the success rate and they downgraded their success rate to 50% after four years. The next one is exogen. And exogen is an ultrasound type of um, device that is used out there. Um, it's, a little, it's different than the electronic or the magnetic. And its main components is that it has an operating unit, it has a transducer, and a target ring locator. Um, it has coupling gel that comes with it. Um, it requires direct skin contact, which makes it a little problematic when you're dealing with someone that has a cast on. So it does require that the cat, their hole be put on the cast because it requires very precise payment placement over the fractured site. Um, ultrasound sound technology works. Um, differently than electric or electromagnetic fields. It's really based on the mechanical stress theory. And what it does is it enhances bone healing by increasing the absorption of calcium ions in cultures of the bone cells. And it also may influence the chondrocyte formation, but then increases the soft calculus. Now, their clinical study was conducted prior to 1998. It's a retrospective study on non-union fractures. Each patient was his or her control, and the treatment protocol that they used was 20 minutes a day. They had 74 patients complete the study, 86% healed, 14% not healed, and the medium healed time was 142 days. The next device is the Orthofix Physiostar Stim, and that is pulsed electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields, and it uses an external single coil device, as you see here in the picture. It's really a pulses of electromagnetic field, and it's a PIMP, is, and the acronym for it is PEMP. It's a high energy, non cell specific signal. And notice the frequency ranges on this are up to 10,000 hertz. Remember the previous one we talked with 60,000? This is 10,000 hertz. And it is a dose response signal. And healing only occurs, again, while the device is worn. One of the things that you always want to look at, especially in workers' comp patients, is what the treatment time is going to be. And um, different treatment times are reported. Anywhere from eight hours, 10 hours, or at least a minimum of three hours. But you have to look at what the patient, when they did their studies, what, how many hours were, uh, were the patients on the device when the studies. Now, what their study showed, it was conducted from September 1983 to July 1984. And again, each patient was or his or her own control. The treatment protocol, though, was eight hours a day. And the results demonstrated 75.8% for patients who completed the study, 323 patients enrolled, but only 140 patients were included in the analysis. And the report success when they reviewed cons consistent users only, and the average time to heal was approximately six months. And one of the things I, I always recommend that when you're looking for a bone growth, especially with a workers' comp patient, 
that you need a compliance meter on the bone growth. Let me give you a personal experience. I had a case manager call me up and said, um, uh, Mrs. So-and-so isn't dealing after the bone growth and spent all this money and I'm very concerned. And I said, well, have you checked the compliance on it? And she said, compliance? I didn't know it had a compliance. So we arranged the patient to go back to the doctor's office and bring in the bone growth stimulator to have it checked. And the lady had only, um, the patient had only used it once. So what I really recommend is that when you have your patients on a bone growth and the compliance, you have them bring it back to the doctor's office on their visit to make sure that they are using it. Um, what happens with a lot of times with bone growth, we tell them that they must and they must use it every day. I can't stress it anymore. Bone growth stimulator must be used consistently. It's almost like an antibiotic. You don't want any breakthrough from day to day. So they must use the device daily. This gives you a way of tracking it. And if they don't, if they're not using you know, compliance to therapy, it's very important in workers' comp. EDI, they also have an external coil. They're a pulse electromagnetic activity tube, so they're technology. There is a dose, they are a dose response signal as well. Again, their, their frequency range is 10,000 hertz, and healing occurs only while the device is worn, and the recommended healing time, uh, treatment time is 10 hours per day. Now, their study was done that they submitted to the FDA in 1975 to 78. Each patient was his or her own control. The treatment protocol was 10 hours per day. And their results were they found 76 reached functional union. Average time to heal was approximately six months. Patients over two years from the date injury healed an average of 7.5 7 months. And long term, you can see that their success was downgraded to 63.5 after four years, and 28% of those patients were lost to follow up. So, People further studied in the late 80s, early 90s, mid 90s, wanted to know what was the optimal treatment range for um, electronic bone growth stimulation. And this is probably the standard by Ruben and McLeod that they determined the, that the best range for frequency for stimulating bone growth was about 150 hertz. Now, all of the bone stem that we have talked about previously they all are, they have that range because remember they're anywhere from 10 to 60,000 hertz, but they found if you want to give a specific dose response, um, that they, it, it's important um, to, the important range was 100, zero to 150 hertz. So um, if you look at here, this is kind of a nice slide because it kind of consummates all of the different hertz of the different uh, bone growth that are out there. There's a, um, certainly the exogen, which does this operates on ultrasound, the bioelectron EBI, and the orthopix, it gives their ranges of frequency for magnetic. And then if you can look at what they do, what's the difference between hemp and combined magnetic field is they really consolidate it to trigger down to that zero to 150 hertz per uh, second. So that is the optimal dose response that is required for bone growth stimulation. And this just shows you, gives you the demonstration of that. Next slide. And the, the CMF, the Don Joy, is an external or dual accord device, dual coil device. There's no skin contact required. Um, it, the LCD displays the treatment time and the compliance meter. It can be used with fixation devices or over a cast. And it's really a combination of the dynamic and static magnetic fields, which increases both the specificity and potency of the treatment. It's cell-specific. It, it works by stimulating. Remember, we talked about those, those growth factors. It, it works by stimulating the osteoblasts and the growth factors. And it's really a 30-minute daily treatment time with carryover for approximately 24 hours. And as I said, 
earlier when I talked about the anatomy, it's really important to look at these growth factors and how this works. And this is how the combined medical medical fields works as it stimulates it, especially when you think of the insulin growth factor, which is big with bone stem, and diabetics, if we're not producing that, you can see whether that would have a factor in both bone healing. So an increase in growth factor secretion by the bone at the healing sites leads to the production of connective tissue and ultimately enhancing the healing process. Now, and I just, this is just a further elaboration of the production of both growth factors in osteoblast and the fractured calculus in vitro and in vivo. I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. All right. The detailed clinical study was conducted in 89 to 91. Again, each was her own control. Treatment protocol was 30 minutes a day. The results were 60.7% healing time for all both bones, 75.6 heal time for the tibia, 73.6 heal time for non-unions less than two years post-fracture, and the average heal time was six months. Now, on the follow-up, it was the only bone stimulator that did not require to down-classify the original clinical study. If you remember on the previous things, months later, they had to downgrade their, their, um, their growth, their healing and 60.7% overall and 73.6 for less than two years post and, um, and then they did further registry study with from 94 to 98, and follow up on 2,370 patients, and they, based on 16 fracture sites, the data was submitted and approved by the FDA that the overall outcome rate is 75.1%, and weighted time to heal was about 4.9%. Point of what I'm getting is, if you'll see on the next slide, most of the bone growth kind of feel in the same particular time frame, and that's why I say any bone growth will, will heal. It's just that there are nuances like batteries, time that the patient has to be on the device um, that you need to you think about or consider when you're putting a patient on a bone growth stimulator. Now, one of the things that I that I think is very important is talking about the economic impact of U.S. patients with fracture non-union. And this is a very recent study. It's 2014. It was done. This this study was done by EBI, but it was it's a clean study, and so it's not. We kind of talked the clinical issue of bone growth. But now we need to talk about the, the, the financial things about for bone growth and how it affects the overall cost. Now, this was submitted. Um, this is economic burden of illness among patients experiencing fracture non-union, and it was published in the Orthopedic Research and Review in 2013. It is a claims study, and it's done, what companies do is they will buy claims information, and in this particular case, it was purchased from MarketScan. They are a commercial and Medicare supplemental insurance database, and there are, and I think in all interest, this was not workers' comp patients' claims data, but it was, it gives you a good indication of what the cost of, in a perfect world, would be as far as non-union fractures. It included adult patients newly diagnosed with a fracture non-union between July 2006 and September 2009. And some of the study's objectives of this claim was to, they wanted to talk about the demographic and clinical characteristics. They characterized the different treatment patterns for patients treated with e-stem, um, ultrasound, and no stem at all. They estimate the total health care costs and cost components, inpatient, outpatient, and medication use for patients comparing the different treatments. And they analyze the predictors associated with outcomes, including the total health cost, utilization, and cost. And when I, when I talk about the cost in the future, those costs also include the cost of the bone stem in, with the, with the um, fracture cost. So they used MarketScan database, 
And market scan is the largest, a lot of pharmacy companies use it. It's the largest proprietary patient level um, database out there. It's over 170 million unique patients. And so what you do is you data mine um, in these databases looking for patients with commonalities that are going on. So what they did is they, they looked at patient claims from 2006 to 2009, as I said previously. The, tr the, the data points where they followed patients for nine, they looked at claims data for nine months before the non-union fracture and one year after the non-union fracture. And the study assessed a large number of fracture location sites. They looked at over 11,000 non-union fractures. The mean age of the patients were 45.4, as we saw in, in uh, Chuck's earlier information, a lot of fractures occur in young people, they, especially in workers' comp, and 40% of the patients were males. The sample size with the ESEM um, was 3,400, what, 3,430, Ultrastem was 1,434, and Nostem was 6, 000, uh, 6, uh, almost 7,000 patients. They found, and other things that was really, I think, very interesting, that diabetes was the most common comorbidity, comorbidity and that metatarsal and metatarsal fractures, non-union, were the most frequently treated fractures of patients. Now, this is a little bit, I, let's do a little bit digger, deeper dive into this comparison groups. Um, we went to the 11,000 cohort, that's, a, that's the group. We split into three groups, the ESEM, and that would be CPT code 20974, and that PICPIX code would be EO747, that's the ESEM group. The ultrasound is CPT score 20979, and the HCPCS code that was looked at was EO 6760, that's the ultrasound group, and no CPT or HCPCS indicating ESAM or ultrasound, but there were coding that indicated that they were a non-union fraction. Now, this is what they found. Um, in the ESAM, the fracture-related intervention was only 33%, and in this case, the lower the number is the, the better number for you. The total healthcare cost, including the cost of the uh, bone growth stimulation was 20,247, and the fracture-related cost was 8,103. Now, if you look at the um, ultrasound, was they had higher fracture-related interventions at 42,000, um, 42%, they had higher total health care costs, and their fracture-related costs were significantly higher as well. Now, when you look at no STEM at all, you can see that the inner fracture-related interventions were 60%, so significantly higher. The total health care costs were almost $4,000, you know, to $1,000 higher, and the fracture-related costs were significantly higher as well. Now, in conclusion, and well, you know, ESAM when compared to ultrasound and no stem proved to really significantly reduce fracture related procedures, lower actual healthcare resource use and total costs, reduced mean predicted overall and fracture related costs in a year after the fracture. Remember the, the, the uh, study went on for a year, the claims data went on for a year after the identification of the non of the uh, non-union, and it's really proven to be a more cost-effective treatment for fracture non-union across a variety of fracture locations. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, we're going to open it up for questions right now, so if you have not done so already, um, please submit your questions into the lower right-hand side of your screen, and um, we're going to try to address some right now. Um, I'm going to start off. I have uh, one, Chuck, I'm going to throw to you um, to start out. Um, how effective are bone growth stimulators, and do they decrease the length of the disability? 
Uh, well, based on Linda's uh, presentation and based on the data and the, the uh, case studies, there is a significant proof to show that both those communities do work and they do greatly reduce the healing time and where non union has existed. Uh, they do show that the healing does occur and it does help that patient get back to work sooner and quicker. Linda, did you want to add anything to that? Um, I, I, I certainly agree with him. Yeah, that is that. I think the key thing when you're dealing with a worker's comp patient is getting them back to work. And people can't, it's hard for people to go back if they have a non union fracture. So you've got to treat that, that site work. Now, I don't know of any studies that correlate the disability with that. I don't think anybody has even looked at that. Um, but I've written that down or I'm going to think about it and see if I can do some research on that because I think that's an important data to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we had is going back to um, some of the different types of uh, bone growth stems. And uh, the question was, does hemp require skin contact? Yeah. No, it does not. Okay. All right. And then we had another question come in. Um, is a bone growth stimulator appropriate for fractured toes? This person says they have a claimant who had all five toes on a foot broken in December of 2013. She's still off work and using a bone growth stimulator, but I do not know what type. Um, certainly it is toes, I'm going to say is tarsal and metatarsal. tarsal. And uh, for that number of bones, remember, those are the most difficult bones to heal. You also have to look at what are the other risk factors, and also, is this patient using the bone growth stimulator? I mean, all those have to be taken into consideration when, when you're looking at that. But certainly, if you saw from the study, tarsals, metatarsals, which are really good, are some of the most common areas for treatment. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what you said, make compliance, make sure that they're using it. Make sure so. that they're using it. And, 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 but, oh, the, and most of the bone growth stimulators, the patient doesn't feel anything. I mean, I think they think they put the, the, the device on them and they should feel a buzz or like a tennis device or something like that. So there's no physical feeling that they have. So um, the compliance is just, I cannot stress it and, and as much. I mean, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, someone had a question about um, purchase versus rental. Are, do, are there different options for these? Um, it, it, and that's a, a, it's a very good topic. Right now, it's a purchase-only device. And the reason is, is that a bone growth stimulator is a class three device, which means it is by, if, you, if you're classified as a class three, you're a single-use device. You can only do one time. And so that's why most have gone through the purchase. The other thing is, is that if you look at Medicare and all those issues, a lot of it is cap rental. And most, not all, I mean, sure, there are some exceptions where it will be shorter. But as you saw the studies, most of the people took about four to six months to heal anyway. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. Someone else has a question. Um, how does coffee, soda, and it sounds like maybe caffeine um, is what they're getting at, impact bone healing? I've heard not about the caffeine, but I've heard where um, sodas, because there's um, phosphorus, you know, the phosphorus that it's the bubbles mm -hmm. on the drink, that it does have some effect on uh, bones becoming brittle. Um, it's just hearsay. I haven't heard anything definite on it, but it could have some of that. Okay. Um, and then going back to the purchase versus rental, one follow-up question. Somebody else. Um, how long should a purchase device last um, once you purchase it? Um, most of the bone growth companies that I've worked with, um, they, they will provide you batteries or additional stuff to keep the battery, to keep the device going as long as, as you need it. In other words, I know like in our particular use of the hour goes for nine months, but at the end of nine months, we will provide additional if they need additional healing. So the bone growth simulation company should be able to provide you the added dimension if there if more healing is needed. Okay. Or time needed. Okay. Um okay, we're definitely getting some questions in here, so I'm just trying to scan them. Um is it typical for doctors to check compliance meters or is it something the adjuster needs to push? I think it's something the adjuster needs to push. I, I, and if you're spending, and this is just the frugal me, 
is that if you're paying that amount of money for bone growth and you know that compliance is very easy and important, I recommend that you have the patient say, I want you to take the bone growth stimulation stimulator to the doctor's office. And, and I don't tell them about the compliance later. I know our, uh, uh, the sales do not tell them about it. So it's important for them to take the device to the doctor. Um, most of the offices have been instructed how to retrieve the information. And um, that's, like I said, this is one way to check this. But these are costly workers' comp patients. I would think nine million. Any of those child would be pretty costly. Mm -hmm. So I would think you would want to make sure that they're compliant to their therapy. So just have them bring it. It's not that big or bulky that they can't bring it into the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up to that, um, I think you touched on this a little bit, but are all our compliance meters available on all types of stimulators? I, I, I think they are. I'm not, I really can't answer that. Too. I think they are. I believe they are. Okay. Um, okay, some more questions coming in. We have a little more time. Um, will scar tissue um, at the surgery site interfere with a, a bone growth stimulator's effectiveness? Um, no, if there are the um, magnetic ultrasound, it may, because sometimes when you have scar tissue, it may be hard to put that transducer over that site or those adhesions just because of the molding of the tissue. But um, the regular pump or the CMF technology should not be a, an issue. Mm -hmm. um. Another question, uh, Chuck, I'm going to throw this at you. Um, what are the indicators for bone growth stimulators, and does a doctor order it immediately after surgery? So it can vary in time from the point that you mentioned or uh, indication. Did you say what are the indications? What are the indicators for bone growth stimulators? So you have nine, obviously, nine years after. Mm -hmm. You think for an extended period of time, um, the natural healing process has not occurred. Um, would you like to add to that? Well, uh, often bone, and we talked today about non immune fractures. Mm -hmm. um, bone stem are also ordered for spine. A lot of times when patients have spinal fusion, there are several studies out there that have demonstrated post-spinal fusion. That and, and spinal fusion is certainly a very, very expensive surgery that is out there with risks involved with it. That patients who use a bone growth postoperatively have better outcomes, healing outcomes than patients who do not use a bone growth. So maybe in conjunction with exactly, exactly. Just and, and the one thing that I would ask is that if you have a patient for a spinal fusion surgery, and 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 the doctor has requested it, that you order it as quickly as you can because the longer the time you wait post-spinal fusion, so having them wear the patient, the less the, your, your outcomes aren't going to be as good as if you wait 30 days out. There's a, like a critical time frame when you're doing a lumbar fusion where the, the bone growth is most optimal in the healing process. So uh, it, if you're going to contemplate have a patient with a fusion and you want a bone growth, I would order it preoperatively so that you would have it there and not drag it out. Okay. Um, here's another uh, good question. Um, should these patients be on calcium and vitamin D supplements to promote healing uh, fractures? I, 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 yes, I do. And the vitamin D is also, remember I talked to you about the GERD and the, the protein stuff about the uh, prilosec and all of that, that affects the vitamin D and the calcium. Mm -hmm. And it, it does not hurt that, mm. so it could help. And another another question on the compliance feature. It seems like people are really interested about this. Um, is it a computerized like feedback or yes. readout? Yes. Okay. No, it's not a readout. It's on the screen. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, it can't be jerry rigged. In other words, the, <laughs> you know, that's the one thing I get. Can't be manipulated by the um, person to say that it does more than what it actually is. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll address um, one more question here. Um, a couple questions going back to um, kind of the comorbid conditions you talked about. Um, you know, how should a bone stimulator be used when dealing with an injury along with, along with health conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and what kind of effect on the fracture healing process can some of these have? Um, you know, it, you know, as I said earlier, if you know, when you have a patient 
that is high risk. And when you're in workers' comp, you don't have a control over the patient who's coming through your door. Um, you know, they may be diabetic, they may have hypertension, they may have the overweight, they may smoke. They have a number of factors. And you can say, I'd like you to stop smoking, I'd like to get your diabetes in order, and you can request all of these things. But, but sometimes, for whatever reason, people don't have, the, they have, you don't have the ability to heal. And my concern is I can see people try to drag it out to the 90 day term points when you have to like try to make a clinical decision on maybe we should get it in earlier. There's no, there's no rule that says that you can't get it in earlier if you need it, especially if you have all of these high risk conditions to it. It's just been kind of the gold standard. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think we had a lot of great questions and um, thank you so much, Linda, for joining us and Chuck. And um, on behalf of my matrix, thank you for joining us. Um, just a quick reminder that if you were participating today and would like to get CE credit, uh, an email will be sent to you uh, by the end of the day with information to register. You do need to register for credit, um, and that link will be open for 10 days um, following today's date. Um, you'll also get a survey. Please provide us your feedback um, to help us plan for future uh, webinars. And again, today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website within the next week or so. Um, so again, thanks for joining us. And we will have another webinar in uh, about the July timeframe. So look for more information on that on our website. Thank you.